to India now, where the parliament is holding a no-confidence vote against the Prime Minister Narendra Modi. Modi has been criticised for not addressing the ongoing conflict in the country's northeast. Ethnic clashes are in the state of Manipur are in their fourth month now. At least 180 people have died in the ongoing violence between the majority Métis and the minority Kuki community. Now, both sides have unleashed vicious attacks on the other, including sexual assaults on women. Tens of thousands of people have been displaced. Indian authorities have imposed curfews and the internet has been shut down since the conflict began a few months ago. Now, DW's Adil Bhatt and Sharik Ahmad travelled to the region and found that calls for a separate Kuki state are growing. These are students in a school listening to a professor. But the school has been repurposed and the students carry guns rather than books. We are going to defend our motherland and that's our main purpose. Professor Lampeti is turning the political theory he used to teach into practice. He has become a leader among the cookie people and is preparing these young people to fight. Are we ready to defend our motherland? Yes, we are ready! That motherland is the hilly part of Manipur. The Kukis Zo and other tribes who live there feel so threatened by the Métis who live in the valley, they want a separate Zo homeland. Rifle number three, clear. There is a great dis uh, discrimination, let me say, let me use that word, discrimination between uh, the hills and the plains. If we say that we don't need arms, that means they are going to take up all our land by force. So the only way is to prevent and to defend, to protect ourselves is taking up arms for now. But the political solution will be there and that's what we want. Until that political solution comes, these earnest young men will carry and use guns. As we film, Lom receives news of intense fighting on the border that separates hills from plains. He sends a small group to go and help. Boys have already arrived to fill their places. Some are already here practicing with wooden and toy guns. The Zokuki Student Federation works with posters and pamphlets calling for a separate state. Leon Nolok is clear. It's time for things to change. Our grandfathers, our fathers have been demanding separate administration for our community. Their enthusiasm is clear as they hunt for somewhere to put their message. and settle on the wall of a hospital. So these paintings or gravities are made by our very own people. These more or less e express our cultural, uh, our cultural desire, our political aspirations for uh, a separate state. These are just uh, symbolism to our political aspirations. Down in Manipur's capital, Imphal, those aspirations provoke fury. These women, members of the majority Métis people, they are determined to keep Manipur whole. The effigy they burn is of the chief minister of a neighboring state. He supports a separate Zo homeland. We believe in uh, United Manipur. We, been in, we believe in one India, and therefore any kind of separatism is strongly condemnable and against it, and Manipur cannot be divided at any cost. These young men may demand a high cost. Some may still be too little to fight. And some may not yet have real guns. But the next generation of cookie fighters is preparing to fight. Let's get more from Dr. Ajay Sani. He's the director of the Institute for Conflict Management. He focuses on conflict in South Asia and he joins us now from Delhi. Welcome to DW, Dr. Sani. Uh, we know that Manipur has a, a decades-long history of conflict. Can you tell us what is different about the violence this time? You see, uh, we have had ethnic conflagrations in the past, but most of the violence that we have seen has been in the... Uh, uh, over these decades, has been of a of the nature of small insurgent groups seeking uh, 
separation or autonomy in different ways. Now, most of these groupings had been brought under some kind of understanding with the government, especially all the hill groupings, which includes Kuki groups and Naga groups. Uh, these are essentially the tribal insurgent formations. And they had been brought under what are called suspension of operation agreements, where they live in camps and surrender their arms. Theoretically, there is, of course, significant violation of agreements. Uh, the, there was still a group of seven uh, Maiti uh, insurgent organizations operating under the umbrella of something called CORCOM, the Coordination Committee, uh, who were still active, but at a very, very low level. I mean, as an ins uh, 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 indication, you can see that uh, last year we had seven total fatalities relating to uh, uh, insurgency in Manipur. Uh, this year, ever since the start of this ethnic violence, there have already been 83 fatalities till last week uh, when we updated our uh, data. 83 fatalities uh, relating to insurgency. This is un unconnected with the uh, deaths in the ethnic clashes. So we see that this history is now sort of, uh, the, this current conflagration has also fed into the insurgencies, uh, uh, the dynamic of the insurgencies that had more or less been contained. We're seeing uh, the Modi government facing a no-confidence vote over its inability to quell violence. So can you help us understand why it is so difficult to stop what's happening? Well, first of all, the no-confidence vote is just uh, symbolic. The, the opposition is simply too small to effectively uh, uh, prevail in a non-confidence vote. So it's essentially a symbolism. Uh, my assessment of the situation is that uh, the, the situation is not coming un under control in Manipur simply because uh, it is not desired to come under control. Uh, I have said this before on your platform and I repeat it. These are orchestrated uh, uh, conflicts. Uh, they feed into an electoral agenda of divisiveness, of polarization which seeks to put commu uh, community against community in order to secure some electoral advantage. OK, so and this if is we... not just electoral. Please go ahead. This is not just electoral uh, advantage in the particular locus where the violence occurs, but is intended to send a message out to all majority community members or uh, people who the Hindutva grouping regards as their uh, primary uh, vote bank. So uh, you're the a, message you're a... goes out to all these. You're essentially saying that this violence isn't being brought, um, isn't being shut down because there are uh, people who stand to benefit from uh, the absence of peace in the region. Absolutely. And this includes a number of people, but the primary groupings that are uh, in, uh, involved are the uh, political ruling party, uh, both in Manipur and at the centre. All right. South Asia conflict and security expert Ajay Sani, thank you so much for helping us understand the situation in northern India. Thank you. Very welcome. Thank you for having me. And for more on this, I'm delighted to welcome Kishle Bhattacharji, a professor and dean of the Jindal School of Journalism in India. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us. Uh, to start, help us understand the context here. What sparked this latest conflict between these two ethnic groups? Well, uh, you know, for, for people who are uninitiated to this region, this is a uh, in the northeastern part of India, but it also has porous borders with Myanmar, uh, with China watching on the other side, geopolitically a very, very important part of India. Uh, it also is the corridor through which India uh, proposes and has been working uh, on this policy of act east or look east, which means looking eastwards to as far east for its trade and other um, activities. Uh, so that is the context, uh, the geographical, the geopolitical importance of this place. But it's also a place which has been ravaged by um, guns, by uh, militarization, by not only by separatist guerrillas, but also by state uh, repression and force for almost over three decades. Um, numerous um, guerrilla outfits operate out there. Uh, the two communities that we are talking about right now, the Meite and the Kukis, both are indigenous communities, which means they have been there for generations. Uh, the Meite, of course, claim that they are, it is their land and the Kukis are outsiders. Uh, a problem which is uh, not unfamiliar to that part of India because the insider-outsider conundrum has defined and redefined the identity politics and the ethno-national assertion of various groups out there, some armed, some unarmed. But I think uh, 
you know, after years of insurgency or separatist uh, guerrilla uh, activities out there, um, what we see right now is the proliferation and the sudden implosion of ethnic identities and violence. So that is the context really under which the, the, the civil war out there is being a pitched civil war uh, has been going on for the last uh, couple of months. Uh, mm -hmm. In fact, the law enforcing agencies allegedly are also taking part, are also pitched in two battles. So it, it's not just the two communities, but there is a state law enforcing agency and a central law enforcing agency which are at loggerheads, mm -hmm. one alleging that the other is supporting the community. Yeah, uh, so long running um, tensions and plenty of complex geopolitical considerations there. But I'm I'm curious why we're seeing this kick off now in the last three months. Has something happened that has really caused this conflict to escalate? Well, um, I would argue that the at the heart of this conflict is land, but that would be too simplistic to really say. Um, this area, the state of Manipur, this province of Manipur really is has a valley and has a hills. Now, the Meitei, one of the communities who consider themselves to be the, the owner of this whole state, uh, who were um, the, the kings and the kingmakers, so they uh, are concentrated in a valley. And because of a certain mm, you know, nomenclature that they have in the Indian uh, constitution, which means they are of the general category and not scheduled category uh they cannot buy land outside this valley uh, mm. but they th they feel that the entire area is theirs and why shouldn't they be able to go outside that valley and buy land and therefore yeah. uh that is that that is the cause of this friction between the people who occupy the hills and the forested areas and the people who are in the in the valley concentrated yeah. who are and, and just just to jump in i'm sorry i'm sorry for interrupting you but i'm also wondering if there's a role of the central government in this conflict is it is it seen as a neutral mitigating force here uh, not at all uh the central forces may be seen by one our, our community at least as a neutral force as a buffer zone but definitely not the central government the state of india has been absolutely absent out there as much as the state government which means the local government and the central government both have been completely absent callous uh manipur has been you know, facing unbearable losses, uh, people mourning the dead. Uh, burials haven't happened over the last uh, since the since the since the trouble started of of not just one or two, but dozens and dozens of, of you know uh, dead bodies lying in the morgues. Uh, people unable to bury the dead, and uh, they have been pulverized by the political machinations of the center and of the state. So, in that sense, the Indian Prime Minister. The Indian yeah. Home Minister, the entire, uh, you know, the constitutional, the entire, you know, the police, the law enforcing machinery yeah. of uh, the country and of the state have been is culpable for what is happening out there in the state of Manipur. Well, thank you so much for joining us. I'm afraid we're going to have to leave it there. Plenty of plenty to talk about, but no more time. That is Kishle Bhattacharjee from the Jindal School of Journalism in India. Appreciate your insights. Adil Bhatt recently returned from Manipur and joins us now from Delhi. Adil, just briefly explain to our viewers again what sparked this conflict in the first place. The conflict started after the Manipur High Court ruling in March granted the majority made a special status, which is called scheduled tribe status. So it actually entitles them to the same economic benefits and quotas in government jobs uh, and education as the minority cookies. So this sparked a reaction. So this demand by Metis was seen kind of as an encroachment of their benefits, actually. So to oppose this move, tribal student federations, they uh, came up with a solidarity march, and this actually sparked a uh, reaction, which eventually, uh, that's why right now we see that Manipur is burning. And since then, there have been uh, attacks, reprisal attacks, rapings, um, mob violence. It, it sounds like life there is also quite restricted because of the measures that have been taken. Yeah, I mean, restricted in hilly areas. If you go to hilly areas, life is totally restricted. So when I went to Manipur, I had two different kinds of experiences there. My first visit to Manipur, it showed that the whole Manipur was tennis. Imphal, where the majority Mete people live, there were paramilitary forces on the street, people were frisking, and then even the tribal areas where these cookies live, it was completely tense. But now, if you see, in my second visit, Manipur was 
calm, better, and the business was going as, as usual as compared to the first visit. So what's happening, if you have to go to the border areas, you have to navigate through different checkpoints. They make you stop, they make you frisk. So the border area, which actually divides the hills to plains, it has become a battleground where the situation is not normal. The environment in the hilly areas is actually tense. You see the environment of fear, environment of suspicion there. So uh, there is an internet uh, blackout going on, which is impacting the lives of the people from the both sides. But as compared to the second experience shows that, uh, it, it shows actually that Imphal is calmer, better as compared to the hilly areas. So some sort of normalcy uh, returning to some parts, but you've still got these buffer zones set up and and um, and checkpoints that you mentioned. But also what uh, I noticed from your report was that this conflict is now spreading into schools. Uh, students are carrying guns rather than books, as you said. How has it come to that? Uh, ben, what has happened is this conflict has reignited the age-old demand of his greater so homeland. So we have to understand why these young guys are picking up arms. They're picking up arms because they have faced historical discrimination or historical disadvantage from a larger majority Mete people. They're saying that not only a historical discrimination, they also say that majority Mete people label them as terrorists, illegal immigrants, that adds to that kind of alienation. So when we got uh, this access to a particular camp where we see these young students who are in the college, who are going to going to university, they're picking up arms now. And the other important thing was the professor who was teaching, there was a social science professor teaching politics in university. And then we saw these uh, young, young, young boys in the report, these young boys in the report, they're also picking up guns. It reminded me kind of, you know, uh, when I was growing up in Kashmir, it reminded me that kind of a situation, that the helplessness among these kids, that there is a kind of a deep passion among these young people to fight for a separate homeland, which was evident throughout the report also. Arul Bhatt, thank you very much for your reporting from Manipur, and we'll be following this closely as the Indian Parliament does debate the topic. Thank you very much.